Hello, BookTube. Well, as you know, if you've been watching this channel, uh, last week I went to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston. Great used bookstore, huge amounts of turnover, tons and tons of stock, both inside and outside. There's a huge sale lot outside, thousands of other books. Uh, and then on the weekend, I made a rare trip to the Brattle on the weekend, on Saturday, uh, to meet there with Mark, with the booktuber whose channel name is Dronzo, uh, so that we could meet in person and and sort of shop around at the Brattle. So when my early morning errands deposited me just a couple of blocks from the Brattle bookshop, first thing this morning, in bitter, single-digit temperature, I, of course, had no reason to go there because I'd been to the Brattle two times in rapid succession in just a matter of four or five days. Uh, so I did exactly in that situation what you would expect. I went to the Brattle. <laughs> I shopped at the Brattle. I got frozen all the way to my giblets at the Brattle. And I got a pile of books <laughs> that I want to show you. <laughs> uh, we'll, start, we'll start with a couple of mass market paperbacks. Now, the first one has to do with FFS, February Fantasy Stories. Uh, booktube event that I'm involved with. It was created by the Bookish Bryants. I'm one of the hosts. And we are going through fantasy uh, in the month of February. Now, the focus for, for FFS is short stories or novels shorter than 250 pages, which for fantasy novels, that's not going to be many. <laughs> Most of them go on at great length. Uh, and I am honoring that. I, I got a, our, our focus for the, for the upcoming week of FFS is grimdark, dark fantasy. And I... I'm familiar with dark fantasy going back, you know, for decades, but grimdark is a relatively new phenomenon, so I wanted to really familiarize myself with that, get a, get accustomed to that. I don't typically like grimdark stuff, so I'll see if maybe I could fix that, maybe learn more about it. Uh, and I mentioned in an earlier video that I wasn't really 100% sure of what it is. It seemed to me to be action-oriented, very gritty, and nihilistic. No heroes. Uh, and uh, Josh at Working Man Reads... Uh, left a comment on the video where I said that. Uh, he, has a, he has a great uh, booktube channel. I'm, I'm sure that you all subscribe to him, but I'll leave a link in case you don't. Uh, he mentioned uh, the novels of Anthony Ryan. He's an author we have seen occasionally on this channel, but not much. Uh, the, he's the author of a series of books called the Ravenclaw books that I, Raven's Claw books that I really liked. Uh, rare instance where the second book in a series, the first one, I liked just fine. The second one, Tower Lord, I thought was much better than the first one. And the first one was no small shakes. Uh, I got rid of these things long since. They they just didn't they didn't seem like keepers. Uh, but Josh mentioned in, in a comment that that Anthony Ryan's books might uh, qualify as grimdark. And he also mentioned in that comment that in addition to the grit and the violence and the nihilism and whatnot, questions of mental health might also come into play, that maybe that's another element in a lot of Grimdark. I'm learning a lot about this. But the minute he said that, I thought, well, hot diggity. <laughs> it gives me a reason to get Anthony Ryan novels again, maybe reread them. Uh, they're too big to count for FFS. Uh, but I couldn't resist getting one of them today. So I got Blood Song. Uh, battered copy, but it'll, it'll serve. This is the first Raven's Claw book, I think. Uh, or no, Raven's Claw, I'm saying Raven Shadow is the name of all of these things. Raven Shadow, not Raven Claw. Uh, I think this is the first one. Uh, and I remember liking it. So I, I you know, it, it's a battered mass market. But when it comes to uh, fantasy and science fiction, battered mass markets almost feel like coming home. So I don't mind at all. The next one is also a bit of a battered mass market. And it's another one of those bantam white spined classics. They did a whole row of these things about 40 years ago, maybe more than that. That I just I don't know why I just love this particular layout, this particular form factor of these Bantam classics. And I found uh, Candide by Voltaire. That's what they look like. They all look like that, uh, and the, the white spine, the black letters, and the the uh, colophon up at the top there. Uh, I found Candide, so of course I grabbed it. No reason. I don't have a copy of Candide except as an ebook. So now I'll just put this on the shelf with all of those others. And then all of the rest of these are hardcovers. And I had no muscular teenager. I had no one to lug these around. I had to lug them myself. Uh, but it was, a, it was a good haul anyway. Um, the first one I don't think is going to stay here long. I'm pretty sure it's going to be making its way up to Vermont. What are you being so dramatic about, baby? Huh? Uh, and it's this thing. Uh, Ocean Life in the Old Sailing Ship Days by John Whidden. <laughs> I'm pretty sure 
that this is going to be making its way up to Vermont. There we have, what is this? Uh, Captain William Chipman as a model ship. This is, this is illustrated liberally throughout. The illustrations on almost every page. Uh, there is the Azov. Not Azog, the killer in uh, the Hobbit movies, but a, a sailing ship. What else have we got here? Uh, and this has just, uh, a, well, actually, I should show you the author, because that's, that's a treat in its own. This is actually inscribed by the author in 1909. There is our author. Uh, this is a collection of, I, I think this is from 1909, right? This is, that's probably what this is. Yeah, this is from 1909, and it's just a collection of uh, sailing lore from the days of sail. Really belongs in Mark Richardson's collection, not, not in mine. Uh, then we have something that does, unfortunately, belong in my collection. This is a really great crime novel. Uh, I, I mentioned that the Brattle had a huge uh, influx last year of murder, mystery, and crime novels. Uh, obviously all from the same person, because they all have their signed editions with the sticker on the, the bookstore sticker saying signed edition. It's obvious that somebody assembled a gigantic library of hardcover first edition signed murder mysteries and crime thrillers and then died. Why else would that collection show up at the Brattle in its entirety? And it did. And I've been picking and picking through it for the, you know, five months now that it's been out there. Uh, that's the way of it at the Brattle. They'll get a huge sale of something and suddenly it will become the predominant flavor in both the sale lot and the, sh the shelves inside. And then... As that is whittled away and, you know, the parts that don't sell are brought down in price and moved all around, then there'll be some other big buy and it will be something else. In this case, a gigantic buy of art books, art and architecture books that, that are, is slowly starting to take over the tone of the, the movable parts of the shop. Uh, but there were plenty of crime novels. Uh, March Mystery Madness is right around the corner, so I indulge myself in murder mysteries, as you're going to see. Uh, this one is not so much a murder mystery as it is a crime novel. Uh, this is Richard Marinick, and this is Boyos. Uh, and it is, uh, for good or ill, the novel of South Boston, of Southie during the time of Whitey Bulger. Uh, it's heartfelt, it's poetically written, I, I have no fault with it at all, except that it at various points it verges on her on uh, heroicizing scum, uh, horrible things. The, the, a, a vibrant, wonderful neighborhood of, of Boston was torn to shreds by this kind of scum. So you know to see it get uh, it, at times in this book, not it doesn't happen often, but to see it at times in this book get the good fellas treatment uh, really rubbed me the wrong way. But I love the book. So, and I found it, you know, for a, a dollar hardcover. I didn't have it, so I grabbed it. But in addition to stuff that I know, like this, I got a lot of murder mysteries that I don't know, uh, just to experiment with them. I mean, they were only a dollar a piece, so I grabbed them. Like, for instance, this one. This is a historical murder mystery. Those are always interesting uh, because there's no forensics. There's no fingerprints. There's no, no even, sometimes no even settled idea of what the law is. Uh, this is by Andrew Taylor, and it's called The Anatomy of Ghosts. Uh, and it, all these, all these things, all these books from this collector have these, these plastic library covers on them. And it takes place in 1786 in Jerusalem College, Cambridge, where the ghost of Sylvia Witchcoat is rumored to have been haunting Jerusalem ever since student Frank Oldershaw claimed to have seen the dead woman prowling the grounds and was locked up because of his violent reaction to these disturbed visions. Desperate to salvage her son's reputation, Lady Anne Oldershaw employs John Holdsworth, author of The Anatomy of Ghosts, a stinging account of why ghosts are mere delusion, to investigate. But his arrival in Cambridge disrupts an uneasy status quo as he glimpses a world of privilege and abuse where the sinister Holy Ghost Club governs life at Jerusalem more effectively than the master, Dr. Carberry, ever could. <laughs> so, <coughs> uh, so our sleuth uh, finds himself right in the middle of a hotbed of uh, conflicting pol politics. And also you've got that neat little thread running throughout that he has written a treatise saying there's no such thing as ghosts. So one of the tensions involved in this book will be, you know, what is it going to end up being? Is he going to be proven right or wrong? I love that sort of thing. I don't remember ever having read this thing, so I will gladly give it a try. Same thing with this next one. I don't think I've ever heard of it. The author carefully notes that it's a signed edition. This is by Andrew Grant, an author I don't think I've ever read, and it's called Even. In his world, staying alive means getting even. 
and it's just some kind of thriller. Uh, introducing a James Bond for the 21st century, taken out of dinner jackets and thrown into the gritty streets of New York. So maybe I'll send this to Criminali when I'm done with it. <laughs> but but for, for no money at all, basically, I was perfectly willing to take the chance. Uh, th then this next one is not so much of a chance, although it's a treat. I haven't read this book, but I have read a lot of books in this series, and I know that I love them. This is the SPQR series uh, by John Maddox Roberts, and this is A Point of Law, which I think is well towards the end of the series. Uh, these these uh, star, let's see here, uh, uh, let's see here, well, the, the character's name is Decius Caecilius Metellus, he's one of them, the Caecilia Metelli, a vast Roman noble family that was real, and they had all sorts of famous members. He's, a, Roberts makes up a member of that family just so that he can have an insider on the upper rungs of Roman society, uh, right at the time when Rome was changing from a republic to an empire. And here he is at an outdoor rally in Rome where he is campaigning for election to the praetorship. It looks like a shoe-in until a man named Fulvius, of whom Decius has never heard, arrives at the pre-election proceedings with a small army of hoodlums and begins to shout at the assembled voters that Decius is a thief and worse. While this is not an unknown effort used to ruin a candidate's chances, it is enough to have Decius' father call a meeting of family and friends, a meeting that ends with the participants going home determined to find some answers to stop Fulvius' efforts to ruin Decius' campaign. Uh, and, uh, and the characters involved there, I will know a lot of them. The, I, I found the first of these books, the first of them in America was called SP, just SPQR which was the inscription, as you can see here, the inscription that the Romans put on all of their official buildings. Uh, I read the first one of these, which was just called SBQR, and thought it was fantastic, just incredible. And I read the second, the third, the fourth, and I think the fifth, and then this author's publication history suddenly became weird, and he stopped getting published in America for a long time. And I, I would hear from customers at my bookstore that they had just read the latest one of these in Croatia or wherever. Uh, this obviously is an American publication, so that must have changed. Uh, but I looked this morning. Now, granted, I was foggy-eyed with cold, but I don't think there were any other SPQR novels out there in the sale lot. I looked, and I don't think I saw any. But this is one I haven't read. So I'm happy to do that. I'm just happy to, to rectify that. And then I know this is a lot of mysteries, uh, but the Brattle provided, and you can't ignore that. When the Brattle gives you something, you have to take it, or you it won't give you anything in the future. And the next one is a murder mystery, but it's also a Regency romance. So you really can't go wrong with that. This is by Patricia Varian, and it is called The Riddle of Alabaster Royal. Weird. It's a Regency cover, but the, the publisher decided just to publish the sketch rather than ink that and color it. So it, it's a typical Regency cover, but you don't ever see them like that. And it's a hardcover. Uh, and it is very appropriately bloodstained. <laughs> so who knows what the, what the checkered past of this book is. But it's a murder mystery that is also a Regency romance, I'm guessing. Uh, which just goes to show you, I mean, we have South Boston. We have the gritty streets of New York. We have uh, 18th century Cambridge. We have ancient Rome. We have the Regency period with a romance element thrown in. It shows you, goes to show you the elastic nature of mystery novels, just in general. That's what makes March Mystery Madness so much fun, is that there's something for everybody. You can find a mystery involved anywhere. Uh, this next one, it's nonfiction. It's a biography. I'm pretty sure that it's in this collection because either the author or the collector thought it did constitute a mystery. It doesn't. Trust me. This is by Michael Harrison, and it's called Clarence. Uh, it's a biography of the the Duke of Avon and Clarence, the, the Duke of Avondale and Clarence. This is it's the biography of of King Edward's eldest son, Prince Eddie, who was uh, unlike his younger brother, who went on to become king. Prince Eddie was handsome and tall and athletic looking. He wasn't athletic, but he was athletic looking. He didn't look anything like his father. In other words, his physical form was very much like his mother. Uh, he was unfortunately a Staggering imbecile. <laughs> Just a staggering moron. Even by the inbred standards of the House of Windsor in these days, when it wasn't even officially the House of Windsor, even by their standards, they were never great intellectual luminaries. Even by their standards, he was noticeably slow. Uh, his tutors despaired of him and noted these things. When they were called in and pressured, they gave details about how th this kid barely knows how to speak, barely knows how to think at all. Uh, but he was personable in his way, feckless, 
uh, aimless, dumb, but personable, and passionate, uh, fell in love with a string of young women, and was implicated in, in a homosexual scandal that may or may not have involved him, which who knows if we'll ever have the details on that. The royal family is pretty good at cleaning up after itself, so we may never have the details. We may never have the truth of that. I myself don't think there's any truth to it, but uh, because we know what he was saying when he was in delirium on his deathbed. He died very, very young. He contracted pneumonia. He didn't accede to the throne. He didn't. That would have changed everything, and it didn't happen. And we know from many eyewitnesses, from many people who were in the room, it was a crowded Victorian room, we know in his delirium what he was saying and what he was calling out. And if you are living a lie, living a double life, if you are you know, an active predatory gay man prowling the underground clubs of London to satisfy your urges, that's what you're going to say when your guard is down. You're not going to call out the names of female paramours. Uh, so I don't believe a word of it, but if I don't believe that, <laughs> that's nothing compared to how little I believe the subtext of this book. Was he Jack the Ripper? <laughs> oh, Frank Spearing wrote an utterly breathless book called Prince Jack that just shrieking, shrilly, hysterically claimed over and over again that Eddie was Jack the Ripper. And this book, this book is, it's a little, un, it's a little poorly served by this line because it's actually a biography of, of Prince Eddie. Uh, a better one than, there are two others that are, that are out there and it's better than either one of them. It's something that I, that I've often wanted to find at the Brattle. So I found it, obviously it's from the same collection. Coming to get Jack the Ripper. Uh, obviously it's from the same collection. Obviously this person you know, the same person who got all these murder mysteries got this thing as well. Very happy to have it. This will I will des will prompt an immediate reread and go on the royal shelf. Uh, but I can assure you, <laughs> beyond a shadow of a doubt, Prince Eddie was not Jack the Ripper. <laughs> okay? Uh, Prince Eddie would often, at meals, in front of many witnesses, get so frustrated with the blunted, with the success of carving his meat with a blunted knife, that he would hurl the knife down and just sit back and wait for his attendant to come in and cut the meat for him with a huff on his face. Just not even a word. Not even could you do this for me. He would just sit back and wait because that happened whenever he had any kind of inconvenience of any kind. Someone who had trouble like that was not lurking around in the dark and the muse behind a, dr behind a druggist shop ready to expertly disembowel a, a, a poor woman when she walked by him <laughs> in 15 minutes. <laughs> And not to mention the fact that on all of the occasions when Jack the Ripper struck, Prince Eddie's whereabouts were attested not only by court circulars and attendance records, but by dozens of witnesses. He wasn't even in the country. <laughs> so it's just, a, it's just cool to think that maybe the heir to the heir to the throne was history's most notorious mass murderer. It's going to be fun to read anyway. I don't remember. I read, uh, I think, a chunk of this book uh, years ago. And I don't remember how much stress Harrison puts on that aspect of it. I think it's mostly just a biography. Happy to find it, though, anyway. Uh, and th this next one, uh, we move out of murder mysteries or even uh, historical thrillers or historical questions of any kind. There's no question with Prince Eddie. But we move out of that to just, a, I don't know what this was doing here. I'm sure that it's by the same collector. It has the same uh, covering and everything. It was, all, it was thickly ensconced with all these other books. Happy to have it. Absolutely happy to have it. This is a book that I have praised on this channel many, many times before. This is Thomas Palmer's book, Landscape with Reptile, uh, which is a study of rattlesnakes, but not in the American Southwest, where they exist 10 to a penny. Instead, this is a study of a colony of rattlesnakes that exists in the Blue Hills of Massachusetts. On a clear day, you can see Boston skyline from the Blue Hills. That's how close it is. And there are rattlesnakes that live there. Uh, and this author examines them in detail and gives you the history, the natural history, the evolutionary history, uh, the paleontological history of rattlesnakes, what they're like. It's a magnificent work of natural history. I not, it's not about an animal that I particularly love, but it's a great, great book. And I have a newer trade paperback that I, I read it twice, and I remember the second time I was reading it thinking, I better be careful. It looks like the backing is starting to come off the pages here. Never in a million years dreamed that I'd find it in hardcover with a, a, with a plastic protection on it and everything. I will, I will retire the paperback and just use this from now on every time I want to reread. Or I want to, I want to catch up with these old frenemies of mine. <laughs> because I hardly ever camped or hiked anywhere where there were rattlesnakes. 
where I didn't either hear them or encounter them directly or get bit by them. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a long checkered history with them, long enough to love this book. So amazing to me in the middle of all, I found it literally in the middle of hundreds and hundreds of murder mysteries. What it was doing there. I have no idea. Uh, then this next one, not a murder mystery at all. This is a lovely edition. I had to get it. I, the minute I saw it, I realized that I have a collected uh, verse of John Dryden in a big Oxford trade paperback that I don't particularly like. I love Dryden. Absolutely love his work. And that volume doesn't reflect it. That volume, scene, it, just, it just shrieks. I, this is made for legions of recalcitrant school children. And today I found at the Brattle for a dollar a version of Dryden that I will really like. This is a version that I that I will gladly put on my shelf. I don't think I can fix it at all. The leather is cracked a little, but it's a nice old edition of Dryden. Those lovely roses all all down the spine. Somebody obviously had the the boards taken off this thing and just rebound. Somebody's whole library looked like this, and just had Dryden there imprinted in the gold. This has all sorts of paperwork in it that appears to be nothing. Uh, but it is a lovely thing here. Let me get the paperwork out. The paperwork is just uh, flyers for events at City at Symphony Hall. But it has the the marbled pages there, uh, and it's nice and solid. It's a good solid thing. Here you open it to uh, the beginning page. You have an engraving of the author behind one of these onion skin pages, and then you have that was the title of the book. The Poetical Works of John Dryden. This is an, an edition by uh, two clerics. Uh, yeah, John, the, the Reverend John Wharton, father and son, I believe. Uh, th that's what it was originally called. And if it had had a dust jacket, that's what it would have said. Whoever made this for their library just retitled it Dryden. And this is double-columned, and it's everything. It's all the verse, but it's also all the translations. So I'm overjoyed to have this. The, my one question is how durable it is. How much will this stuff flake off? And is there any way to protect it from flaking off? I don't think there is. Unless I were to find maybe a, one of these glassine protectors for this thing. It's slightly bigger uh, than a normal hardcover. So it, it, won't, it might not be the, the easiest thing in the world to do. But if I could find one of those library covers for this thing, that would protect it as much as it needs protecting. This is going to be a great occasion for rereading. And the uh, the editors here, they put footnotes at the bottom uh, to explain things. And they also start this off with uh, Samuel Johnson's Life of John Dryden. They include that in this volume. Fantastic. Just just great. This is the, the Dryden volume that I have always wanted, didn't know it existed, type of thing that you'll see at the Brattle. I just need to protect it. That's all. I need some sort of, of plastic protection for it. And I... I don't have any of those things. I don't know which ones are easiest to apply or whether you can get only one. Probably have to buy 100 at a time. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Uh, and then we'll, we get to the last book here for this uh, impromptu, totally unnecessary Brattle visit. And it's, uh, it's oversized. It is, I suppose, part of that giant buy of art and art-related stuff. The problem with that giant buy is that uh, my artistic tastes are not exactly refined. <laughs> I know what I like, and I like what I know. But I, I, first of all, I, gigantic, super heavy art books are against the ethos of how I am collecting books these days anyway. They take up a huge amount of space. They add a huge amount of weight to the floor, and they're barely ever consulted. So, I, I, you know, I don't want those just because they're there and they're pretty. And a lot of the artists or artistic stuff that I would like, I mean, it's a sign of what a barbarian, what a vulgarian I am when I'm out there prowling the carts or the sale wall with those art books that I'm looking for New Yorker collections. That's a sign of about where my art appreciation goes. Uh, but I was overjoyed to find this thing. And it definitely counts. This is the ever, 10 Everlovin' Blue-Eyed Years with Pogo by Walt Kelly. <laughs> with a dust jacket on here. Just fantastic. Uh, the, you Marvel fans out there who are wondering, wow, Mar th this Walt Kelly guy must have been really influenced by Marvel Comics since you grew up with Ben Grimm of the Fantastic Four referring to himself as the ever-loving blue-eyed thing, you have uh, the order wrong. It was Stan Lee who grew up loving Walt Kelly and mimicking his humor whenever possible. And so did everybody else. Uh, you could make a very short list of absolutely brilliant American cartoons. Just brilliant American cartoons. You could make a very small list of the best of them all. 
Lil Abner would be on that list. Prince Valiant would be on that list. I would argue that Calvin and Hobbes would be on that list and Doonesbury. But so would Pogo. <laughs> Very much so would Pogo. These are the adventures of Pogo Possum in Okie Ronoki Swamp. <laughs> who has whose world is very sarcastic and very endearing and very reflective of the politics of the day. <laughs> some of the uh, some of the animals in some of these things end up looking quite a bit like uh, current day politicians, <laughs> whether it's Lyndon Johnson or McCarthy or whatnot. But the thing that I love about this book, I'm so oh, I'm so overjoyed that I found it. The thing that I love about this book is that it's not just an anthology of the first 10 years of Pogo. Instead, it's, oh, let me show if I can show you what I mean. It's, uh, it's Walt Kelly walking you through those 10 years. He intersperses the cartoons uh, with text where he writes about what was going on, how the cartoon strip was changing, how it originated, what he was thinking about. And that's a joy, not only because to me that's just as interesting as the comics themselves, but also because Walt Kelly is a fantastically funny writer. Whether it's inside the word balloons of Pogo or whether it's in prose, he's a fantastically funny writer. <laughs> and th so th I remember reading this thing. It was an absolute joy. The idea that I now own a copy in perfect condition with a plastic dust jacket so that I'm not going to rip it is just great. And I strongly suspect that this will be the foremost reread tonight. I will try to control myself, but... In my life, I have never been able to do that. When it comes to Prince Valiant or Lil Abner or Pogo, I can't control myself. I say, just going to read a few pages, and I don't. I end up reading as many pages as I have. <sighs> it, there are worse things. <laughs> so, so that was my brattle hall for today. We have the ever, 10 years of the ever-loving blue-eyed Pogo. <laughs> fantastic. Just fantastic. What I wouldn't give if more Pogo collections came down the pike in that art that massive art buy. Although this is the one I really wanted. So uh, then the poetry of John Dryden in somebody's, you know, bound, lovely edition. I, I just have to protect somehow. Then Landscape with Reptile in hardcover. Totally unguessed. Totally didn't expect to see this. Then we have Clarence, a biography of Prince Eddie. Uh, and then a bunch of murder mysteries. We have The Riddle of Alabaster Royal, a Regency romance with blood on the spine. We have A Point of Law, an SPQR mystery set in ancient Rome. We have Even, a revenge thriller set in the mean streets of New York. We have Anatomy of Ghosts set in at Cambridge University uh, centuries ago. We have Boyos set in my very own South Boston. Not just an area that I know every street, every house, every person, every surname, but also the time when I knew it. Uh, then uh, Ocean Life in Old Sailing Ships, which I'm pretty sure is going, is going up to Vermont. And two mass market paperbacks. We have this old Candide, that I will reinforce and then put on a shelf with all of its like. And finally, Blood Song by Anthony Ryan, uh, which will aid me in my exploration uh, of grimdark, of grimdark fantasy. See if, I, if maybe, if I start with an author that I really like, I mean, Working Man Reads says that this is grimdark. So I'll start with an author I already know I like, and maybe that'll work my way in, that plus the anthology that I'm working my way through. Uh, but that is, that is the battle for today. It was punishing, but I had to be there. I was in the neighborhood anyway. Believe you me, if I'd had my druthers, I would have waited until Thursday or Friday morning, when at the same time at the Brattle sail carts, it would have been 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And not bitterly cold, not punishingly cold, uh, where you go inside and start gasping for air. But I didn't have a choice. And I think I made up pretty well for an impromptu trip. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.